Hello, and welcome to this iThrive webinar series called Planning Your Exit Strategy. We're going to inspire you and help you plan and execute your daily business with the end in mind. This session is called To Sell or Not to Sell. What are my options? And we'll explore the various options for exit from private practice. I'm Scott Jens from my executive business coaching service called Sandbox. And as always, I'm thrilled to serve as moderator of this iThrive series. It's a tremendous pleasure to introduce today's featured expert, Dr. Mick Kling from San Diego, where he is the founder of a multi-doctor independent practice called Envision Optometry and is an avid lecturer who serves the role of practice management and transitions advisor for Vision Source. He's also built a consulting business that focuses on finance and optometry called The Profitable Doctor. Hello, Mick. Hey, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity and really most grateful that you asked about this particular topic. And it's something that I think is on the forefront of a lot of our uh, colleagues' minds right now. So just the opportunity for us to maybe clarify some things about what's happening within our industry, I think is, is very, very valuable. Um, I've been doing this topic for a couple of years uh, just because it's become such a important thing for us to consider. And um, it's really evolving and literally uh, from a week to week ba basis, the, the content changes. So I'm really going to do my best to give you guys the most up to date information on what's happening in the PE market. Well, thanks for that, because I've been tracking what you've been contributing to our knowledge. And I have to say, you're a preeminent expert. So it's wonderful you're here. We're going to learn today about the history of practice exits that have been facilitated by these large financial funds called private equity funds. And what's really great about the expertise you bring, Mick, is that we're going to be able to follow up with you on other topics around numbers. But today, we really want to talk about practice transitions and mindsets. So let's get started. Um, we've been optometry friends for a long while. And I mean, you have really consistently given optometrists advice around the topic of cash flow analysis. But you now have also been this expert on private equity and practice buying. How did that come to be? Well, you know, I, I really sort of fell in this because as a fellow OD that owns a practice, you know, I was approached with an opportunity to get involved with a, a local group here in San Diego where I am. And it was a, it was a group of fellow ODs that I knew very, very well and uh, was, was, had done some business transactions with in, in the past. And so very much trusted them. And I got quite far down the road of exploring this as a possibility for my own practice. And through the process of that, I really learned a lot about the industry as a whole but really what I, I did was I, I, it forced me to really give some long, hard thought to what do I need to be considering as a private practice owner? When would this make sense for me? When would it not make sense for me? What are all the pros and cons? And so I, I really sort of forced myself to go through that, that um, education process of not only learning what is private equity, but also how is it going to really impact me if I decide to, to, to take that route? And so that's that's really where my expertise came in. Expertise is probably a, a generous word. It's probably more of just sort of learning from hard knocks and my own experiences and, and thought processes. And, and really, quite frankly, asking a lot of questions from uh, folks in our industry that, that have already gone down this path as well. Well, let's say it this way. You have a strongly informed base of knowledge. That's it. And just a quick one. Did you end up staying independent? Uh, have you moved your practice along? What, what did you end up doing for your practice? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I gave this presentation uh, at, a, at a, a national meeting a few weeks ago. And one of the questions at the end of the presentation said, I love the information, but did you sell or not? And I thought that's exactly what I'm trying to do here is educate doctors on what's going on in the market without a bias. Perfect. But to answer your question, I did not sell. There were some very unique things to my particular situation that made me feel like the best decision for myself and my practice and my family was to ultimately remain independent. And that's one of the first things that I learned about this is that we all have unique, different personal reasons why we make the decisions that we make. And while it might make sense for one person, it may not make any sense for somebody else. And so it's very um, important that we don't become judgmental 
about a decision that a colleague might make because there may be some health issues involved with the doctor or a family member. There may be some other things that are influencing the decision. So I, I just learned that it's a very, very personal decision that we're all going to need to make. Well, I love the fact that you're going to come at this where it's totally objective. It shouldn't really, it won't matter what you did personally, because to your point, it's it got a different appeal and a different ra rationale for everybody. Before we go any further, I alluded earlier to these financial funds. The phrase private equity contrasted to something called venture capital. Could you give us some definitions? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, pri the term private equity or sometimes abbreviated PE often gets confused with venture capital. Here's the difference. Private equity companies basically are an aggregation of funds, of, of investors. And a lot of times these are institutional investors like pension funds, um, well-established sources of, of money that invest in very well-established profitable companies. So they're not looking to take a lot of risk. They're looking for industries that have proven to be profitable because they have a fiduciary responsibility to generate a return on investment for the investors that, it, that have funded that private equity fund. Venture capitalists, on the other hand, tend to be more risk takers. They tend to get in companies sooner, maybe in industries that have not yet proven. If you've ever watched Shark Tank, Shark Tank is a great example of venture capitalists. These guys are looking for companies that are new to market with a new idea or new product they want to get in early because the upside reward is much greater, but the risk is also much greater. So where private equity looks for very stable companies and very stable industries that, that have a proven track record, venture capitalists typically look for new and emerging technology, new and emerging ideas. The other term I just throw out, Scott, for clarification is you might have heard the term angel investors. Angel investors are typically individuals, high net worth individuals that are using their personal funds to invest in, in companies, new ideas like a venture capital firm would do, but it's the individual that's making the investment, often in exchange for equity or a piece of that company. So those three terms kind of get used interchangeably, but they're quite different in the market um, as to what they do and, and who they invest in. And believe me, I've interacted and dealt with all three of those layers. And the only thing I can add is that angel investment is at that startup level. And yeah. to your point, venture capital is still at a relatively startup level, like San, uh, like a Shark Tank. You, you mentioned that you know these, these investors are people who are trying to make a lot of bets, somewhat risky, um, and not usually for the majority of the company, but for a significant minority of the company. And so private equity, these firms, these funds came into optometry. Um, this, is, you know, there, this was preceded by decades of ODs selling their practices to other ODs. So private equity comes into eye care to buy practices. Why? Yeah, that's a great question. And it really almost came out of nowhere. I, I remember um, getting that call from a colleague of mine and, say, and proposing this idea. And I thought, what, what, why would we even do that? And, and literally after that, things just got really um, hot in the market. And um, if you do a little bit of research about eye care as an industry, there's a, there are a couple things that really are appealing to private equity because, again, they're looking for stable industries. We have an aging population. You know, as, as, as our population gets older, the number of ophthalmologists in the market is pretty flat. And um, so optometry is going to be looked at as the place to really deliver care, not only on the medical side, but also on the, on the eyewear side. So they see that aging population as a big benefit. We're clinical based. We do provide medical care, but we also sell products. And they like the idea of the retail piece as a hedge for our industry. And not only we make money on, the, on providing medical services, but we also have profitability. And, and quite frankly, a large portion of our profitability comes through the um, retail side of, of the things that we do. We're a very fragmented industry. We're, we're like a bunch of um, islands out in this big ocean, and there's nothing really holding us together except for possibly alliance groups like Vision Source or PECA or IDOC. But besides that, we're all these independents 
And when you can aggregate a large number of independents into one entity, it gives you enormous leverage in the market. And so they see that opportunity to bring all these stray cats, if you will, into one pin. And then when, when they're controlled within that in arena, then they've got leverage with the vendors. And then we just have, a, a, our industry is just very stable as far as growth. We've got, we're a $35 billion industry with a pretty strong three to 4% growth rate every year. And um, that's been consistent for, for a long time. And there's over 20,000 independent practices in the US. So they see this big industry, steady growth, huge opportunity of a bunch of independents that really don't have a lot of affiliation with one another, except for on a loose scale. And then they see this opportunity to come in and take advantage of that. The other thing that I would just add to that is that they've already been through veterinary medicine and um, some of the more ancillary services around medicine. They've hit dentistry. So it just kind of makes sense that eye care would be the next evolution for their target. That's a great point. Uh, a lot of us know of you know regional or national chains of dentistry practices that went through this exact same thing. Um, I can even tell you that at one time I spoke to somebody who was looking at what's called the death care industry or the funeral home industry, very similar. So, uh, okay, that's good to know. So um, we're going to talk in a moment over some slides that you have that help us understand who's out there. But before we do that, each of these private equity buyers has a different type of operating model, perhaps. Um, could you just give us an oversight of what these operating models are like? Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, part of my job is that I, I do see a fair number of these contracts. And the one thing that I can tell you is they're all different. And um, the, the companies all have different objectives. And even the, within the PE firms, the deals that they do one-on-one -on -one with a seller can often vary. But they're basically, um, they all have the same objective to, to acquire your practice, of course. But they have different philosophies about what they want to do with your practice after they acquire it. There's the branded, what I call the branded model, which would be a model that would take your practice and put the, the branded shingle on the outside. So for instance, if you're, you know, Dr. Jones optometry, um, you might now become, uh, you know, USA Eye Care with that new banner and that new logo. Then there's the unbranded model, which is, they're not going to do anything to the exterior appearance or the, or the patient facing side of your business. The only thing that really changes is the ownership, obviously, but then the operations are managed by somebody else, not you because you no longer own the practice. But yet from the perspective of the patient, it um, doesn't look like anything has really changed. And then some of the other minor differences is some of these private equity firms will allow you to reinvest or, or leave some of the proceeds of the sale of your practice, what we call on the table, so that you have some equity in the new entity that you become uh, a part of. So they all kind of come at this with a slightly different strategy. Um, and that I think plays will play into your decision to some degree as to which of the companies would make sense to work with, because it might be important for you not to change the shingle on the outside of your practice. It may be important for you to retain the legacy of the brand and the name that you've created. Okay, so that all makes sense. That's, uh, that's a super summary of the operating models. Uh, we've got a few slides then to talk about the way that this market has uh, evolved. Walk us through some of these. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are just a myriad of companies out there that are doing this, but in, in the eye care world, there are a handful that have sort of risen to the top, if you will, as far as making the biggest splash and, and the most acquisitions. And one of the things that's sort of unique about all of these companies uh, that have really sort of come to the forefront in eye care is there's some, there's some commonalities as to what they're looking for. They're primarily looking for strategic locations. Are you in an area that um, makes sense for their model? They're looking generally for larger practices that do over a million dollars in revenue. They're looking for practices that have a fairly high EBITDA, which we'll talk about in a, at a later time, but that's a, it's a valuation number. They're looking for committed doctors. Believe it or not, one of the misconceptions with private equity is they're not looking for you to sell 
and then walk away. They really see you as the owner of the practice, especially if you've been delivering patient care. They expect you to be the glue that holds the value of that practice together. So they're looking for doctors that are willing to stay committed for a number of years post-transaction. And then their ultimate goal as a firm typically is for some of them, and this isn't true for all of them, but for some of them is to flip this uh, aggregated entity into potentially another private equity firm. Now, the big ones that we uh, see in, in eye care, I'll just run through a couple of these uh, that are circled here. ESP, eye care service partners, was one of the first ones to start making ophthalmology and optometry acquisitions. Um, Kepler's model is pretty well known, and it is, um, they tend to target more um, higher uh, reputation doctors, if you will. I'm not sure that's the right way to put it, but they go after practices. They're less location specific and more looking for really good uh, doctors that are looking for long term partnerships. My Eye Doctor is probably the biggest branded uh, entity out there. They have the most number of locations and have done the most transactions. Eye Care Partners operates out of a number of different brands. The biggest one and the one that our listeners might be familiar with would be Clarkson. Acuity is making a pretty big splash in the Midwest in particular. They're, they've acquired quite a few practices in the middle of the country. And then we have a couple of outliers that I want to mention, Scott, VSP Ventures. So of course, everybody's affiliate or familiar with VSP, but VSP now has an entity called VSP Ventures where they're now acquiring practices. They've uh, acquired several in California uh, and those transactions, I think we're going to start to see some more activity from them. And then the last one is FYI Doctors, which is a little bit different because it's a Canadian company and it is owned by optometry. So it's a similar model to private equity with the big difference being that um, it, is, uh, it is OD owned. And so when you sell to FYI doctors, you become part of that entity as a, as a doctor owner. So you can see there that even in those examples I gave you, they all have a slightly different strategy and, uh, and a slightly different philosophy about how they wanna run the business and grow the business. So one of the things that I wanted to just touch on about this, uh, these different platforms is really talk about some, some names that get confused often in the market. So the thing that I want uh, everybody to understand is that we, when we talk about these brands, there are really three layers of um, uh, branding that you might encounter. So there's the PE firm. So this is actually the private equity company and they will invest in many different industries. They might own some uh, restaurants and they might own some real estate. They might own some dental practices, but they have, they have their money spread across tons of industries uh, all throughout the country. When it comes to eye care, they will then often create what's called an eye care platform and they will have a branded name. And the example that I have up here is um, FFL Partners, or I'm sorry, Partners Group, it used to be FFL, which is now Partners. Their eye care platform is called Eye Care Partners. And under the air eye care partners, they have Clarkson and several other branded locations. So it's really difficult sometimes to keep track of what all these brands are. But just remember, you've got the PE firm on the top. In this case, it's partners. You've got the eye care platform, eye care partners. And then within that, you've got multiple brands which will encompass various locations. So I just wanted to, to share that because that part of it often gets very confused about what are all these different brands mean and who are they and what, what, how does it really impact me? Well, this is a really helpful slide because these different layers matter. And of course, we're talking to the doctors who are thinking about whether their practice in either a branded or an unbranded platform would fit down in this lower corner, but it all goes up to the PE firm and the way it looks at a segment of a market. I mean, even their title on the slide, realizing potential in private markets, They're looking at the independent private eye care market and their platforms, eye care partners. It's a great way to talk about it. Let's shift to what are the potential benefits and the potential drawbacks. Uh, if you don't mind, I think we've got another slide. Let's go there. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, this was sort of the mental gymnastics that I put myself through when, when I was considering what would be best for my practice. And I, I first started thinking about, okay, what would be the potential advantages and what sort of came to mind is that there were about three different buckets of, um, impact that this would have on me. And I, I threw those buckets into operations, personal benefits and financial benefits. And, um, I won't read through all of these, but each one of these, there was, there are certain benefits to me as a selling doctor on the operations side, just relieving myself of the stress and the anxiety of operations and allowing um, executive talent to come into the business seemed to be a real plus for me, something I was really interested in. On the personal side, you know, one of the things I hear from a lot of selling doctors is I just want to be the doctor. I went to optometry school to take care of patients and do eye exams. And I find myself stressing over the, the money, uh, dealing with cash flow problems. And I just want to be the doctor. And that is a very, very compelling in, advantage for a lot of folks that are thinking about selling. And then on the financial side, the two really, really big advantages that I saw in my opportunity was the valuations are generally higher these private equity firms, because there's a lot of money in the market right now, and they have a financial responsibility to invest that, they're willing to pay doctors a higher margin, a higher uh, valuation on their practices than what a traditional lender would, uh, would lend to a buyer. And so that's very appealing to the seller. You, of course, want to get the most out of your practice. The other big advantage is the, the, how quickly they can close transactions. If you go through a traditional sell with a, with a traditional buyer and the buyer's got to go to the bank and get funding, that can be a drawn out process and can literally sometimes take years to happen. With private equity, they've got the money ready to go. They're ready to be, uh, make it a turnkey transaction. So how, how quickly and rapid you can close these deals was a really big advantage uh, to me on the financial side. So there are many, many more advantages uh, but those are just, I wanted to highlight a couple of the ones that, that, uh, that came to mind. The other one that I'll, I'll before we get to some of the, the downsides, the other one that I, I think everybody should be aware of is, is this so-called idea of a second bite at the apple. And what that means is that a lot of these firms will allow you to leave some of your proceeds from, from the sale of your practice in the, the, the new entity. So in other words, you get an equity stake in the new entity that has acquired you. The idea being is that portion that you're leaving on the table uh, as the new entity continues to grow and potentially eventually flips to another buyer, you would then reap the reward of having some ownership in that second entity. So in the finance world, that's called taking a second bite of the apple, which means you're getting a second round of opportunity uh, to potentially make more than had you just taken everything uh, up front when you initially sold the practice. If you want to go ahead to the next one, we'll talk about some of the downsides that I, I wrestled with. And um, I put these in the same three buckets, operations, personal, and financial. And, you know, on an operations side, um, as, as much as it felt great about having somebody else take that, the control of that, it also meant I was giving up control. And so being somebody that likes to be in control of the direction of my practice, that was something I really had to give some sig significant consideration to. And I felt that as, a, as somewhat as a disadvantage that I would now not be a big decision maker. If they wanted to come in and paint the walls green um, that would be something that I would just have to live with because those were no longer uh, my decisions. On the personal side, um, there may be some demands that they required of me that I was not willing to, to make. Maybe there were uh, the exam template, for instance, was, uh, had a fuller schedule than the pace I was used to working at. Maybe um, there were some things that I uh, didn't like to do. Maybe they were going to move me to a different location if... Uh, if my practice wasn't busy enough, how is this going to impact my patients? What was going to happen to the culture in my practice? So all those things really impacted me on a, on a personal side. And then on the financial side, we always tend to make, I say always, most of the time as an owner, you tend to make more money because you, you are compensated as the, the worker being your practice. Plus you're 
have a return on investment as an owner of your company. But when you sell, you now become an employee of that company. And so there may be some reduction in your compensation. Um, there may be some uh, language in the contract that has something to do with performance guarantees. So if you don't perform to a certain level, uh, it's possible that you may have some of the, 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 the valuation pulled back from you. Those are called clawback agreements. So there are definitely some financial considerations that uh, we, we need to take into consideration when we're, uh, we're considering. So think about your operations, your personal and your financial, both advantages and disadvantages when you're going through this decision-making process of, of trying to decide if this is right for you. Well, that is a very complete summary. Thanks for that. And it's really awesome to hear you think about each of these buckets and how each one of them does have an important critical nature in the doctor's life. Uh, so that's really important because, I mean, our, our, our personal lives are intertwined with our practice lives as business owners. As we get closer toward the end of this session, I'd like to just get a little more input uh, so you could summarize some of your thoughts for the doctors who are watching. Uh, when you give us a little bit of a sense of the, the doctor who doesn't sell and stays independent, what are they going to do to make their practice thrive while making, uh, you know, remaining independent and making the most of their practice? Yeah, you know, the, for me, one of the biggest things that I wrestled with was, was FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> You know, that feeling of, am I missing this window of opportunity? Am I, um, is there something that I'm not thinking about that I should be thinking more clearly about? What happens if all my friends get rich and I don't? I mean, let's face it. Those are things that go through our mind. Maybe they're irrational, but that fear of feeling like you're missing an opportunity really um, weighed heavy on me and, and really caused me to, to really spend a lot of time contemplating this. Ultimately, I decided looking at the longevity of my practice, the personal things that were sort of in influencing me, I felt like we, my practice was on a very good path. Um, we were making money. We were paying off our debt. I could see that my future was going to be brighter by continuing to focus on the things that we had been doing and being successful at, that I just felt like the long term, beyond five years, was going to be a big payoff for me. And so I think the message for doctors that are thinking, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get sucked into FOMO. I'm going to go ahead and hang on. Continue to just focus on what's been working in your practice. Make sure you're understanding how you're managing the finances of your business. Make sure that you're constantly building on your culture, refining your culture, and making sure that you're delivering the kinds of care to your patients and the services that you offer and the products that you offer are things that are going to ultimately benefit your business. So while there's not one thing that I could tell you to do to, to, to remain successful, it's continue doing what you've been doing that's been successful in your practice. And as long as you've got a time horizon that feels good for you, you're going to continue to reap those rewards. One other sort of permutation of this is whether a doctor could go test the market and, you know, look at alternative traditional associate to partner transitions um, and then just stay the course. Do you know if the market currently allows the doctor to sort of dip the toe in the water and she can decide if this is good for her or not? Or is it not really the doctor's decision to test the market? I, I think always thinking about your exit strategy is really a good idea. And, and we should always be testing the market. We should always keep our fillers out for opportunities. One of my roles outside of my private practices is I'm a business consultant for Vision Source, and I work with Vision Source practices that are transitioning. And what that means is at any given moment, a practice might be, a, a doctor might be thinking of selling and needing some guidance and assistance in how do I transition that practice to another younger OD. There are many, many ODs out there that really feel um, a moral obligation to pass their legacy on to the next generation of optometrists. And I have to tell you, I commend those. I'm not at all suggesting that uh, I would have any negative thoughts if you decided to sell to private equity, if you thought that was best for you. But I, I really feel um, good about those practices that like the idea of passing their practice on to the next generation of ODs that want to experience that. Because that's what happened to me 
That's what happened to a lot of us. We had a, a, a senior doctor that, that trusted us and invested in us and took the risk on us to buy their practice and continue that legacy. I can tell you, Scott, there are lots and lots of transactions happening like that all the time. So it's not all going the private equity market. There's lots and lots of what I'd call traditional acquisitions that are occurring all the time. And I would encourage sellers to always be looking at all those options, including, including that traditional market. Well, this has been an incredibly comprehensive summary, Mick, and I can't thank you enough. I think my big takeaway is that a doctor's really got to think about what do they want and, and plan with that exit in mind. And that doesn't matter if you're 30, 40, 50, or 60. I really appreciate you giving us those insights today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I so appreciate the opportunity, Scott. I think this is such a great topic and I uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to share the insight that I have. Well, all right, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending this iThrive webinar series, Planning Your Exit Strategy. Make certain to look at all the other installments in this series because each one has important insights that can help you plan and execute your daily business with the end in mind. Until our next iThrive installment, be great at all you do.